I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. I like to show just a little skin at the beginning of a talk. Ow! Ow! <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's a little intimidating to be sitting up here with Batman. Ah. The Batman. I like, to put, I like to put the in front of it, because in a lot of people's minds, you are, you are the Batman. Well, thank you so much. Right? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I have an advantage. I haven't, look, I have an advantage over the live action uh, actors, because Batman is an animated character. He lives really in your imagination, in your, in your creative thought, right? That's where animation lives. So when they try to put that into live action films, it just never really translates completely. It's a, it enters a whole nother world. And when those actors try to inhabit the character that way, it's, it's just much harder to do. When I am giving a voice to an animated character, I'm living in your imagination. Think about that. It's a very intimate place to be with people. People come up to me at cons all the time and say, you know, I grew up with you. You were like my best friend when I was five, you know. Um, and they have a, there's an intimacy with my version of Batman that is much greater than people's experience with the live action uh, Batman. So I have, a, I have an unfair advantage over those actors just by nature of the world that I inhabit, the, the, the animated world, you know what I mean? So that's how I feel about but it. But you are going to be playing a live action. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> but that's in, uh, for those of you who don't, know, who don't know, it's in Crisis on Infinite Earth. It's the Batwoman uh, crossover of all of the CW superhero shows, Superwoman and Flash and all that stuff. They do a fall crossover. And uh, they asked me to do old Bruce Wayne. Uh, so it's the first time I'm doing it on camera. But it's not. <laughs> That's a big, it's a big deal. That's a really big deal. <laughs> but, it is, but it is old Bruce Wayne. So it's, you know. But it's still Bruce Wayne. It's still Bruce Wayne. It doesn't matter. It's Bruce Wayne. Now, when, when they asked you to do this, did you, did you have some uh, uh, maybe anxiety or nervousness to play a live-action Batman? They asked me, and before they got the last word out of the mouth, I said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's how much anxiety I had. They said, would you be interested in doing a live-action Bat? Yes! <laughs> have you been waiting for that moment for a long time? Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I thought it would never happen. Because as I got older, I've been doing this for 27 years. I know. I know. It's amazing. I was 10 when I started. <laughs> because look at me. I'm no older than 37. 45, maybe. No. Uh, no, it's, it's weird. It's weird. It's been a much longer job than I ever thought it would be. Look, I was a stage actor from New York. I, had, I trained at Juilliard. Um, I, it's all I did was stage acting. I started when I was 17. I've been supporting myself as an actor since I was 17. And uh, I trained in Shakespeare and the Greeks and all the classics. I worked at the San Diego Shakespeare Festival, the New York Shakespeare Festival. I did Broadway, Off-Broadway. I happened to be in LA doing a, uh, a pilot for a series. And, and the big secret about New York actors I discovered after I'd already become one is that you can't support yourself by doing it. No matter how much you work, there's not enough money. So all these New York actors who are busy at night working on the stage, during the day, they're doing voiceovers. They're doing commercial voiceovers, any kind of supplemental kind of work to, to, to supplement their income. So I started doing commercial voiceovers in New York because New York is Madison Avenue. That's where all the commercials are made, the commercial voiceovers. But there are no animated voiceovers in New York at that time. Animation was entirely in, in Hollywood. So I had a voiceover agent. 
I happened to be in Hollywood doing a pilot for a series, and he said, hey, they're doing this new show over at Warner Brothers. Why don't you give it a shot? I know you've never done an animated character. Uh, it's called Batman. I said, Batman? That's been around forever. I grew up on Batman. He said, no, 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 it's never been done as an animated show. I was so naive to the whole Batman lexicon that I didn't know it had never even been an animated show. So I walk in like, you know, the idiot that I am, and I walk in and I meet Bruce Tim, Eric Radomski, Paul Dini, Andrea Romano. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm meeting the gold standard, right, of animation, but this is when everyone was in their 20s. No one knew, or in their 30s. No one knew who great these people were, how great these people were then. So Bruce Tim says, now what's your familiarity with Batman? I said, well, I grew up on the Adam West show. I know that one. And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> he said, we love Adam, but that's not what we're doing. Because all I knew was, you know, zip, bam, bow, you know. And um, he said, no, don't you know the Dark Knight? His parents were murdered when he was a child. I said, seriously? He said, yeah, he's been, he's been living in the shadows to avenge their death. He's, he's a champion of justice. He's, he's the great detective. He's, he's living a dual identity. I said, well, you're kind of telling the Hamlet story. And he said, well, no one's made that analogy before. <laughs> but see, I was just using what I knew. I was relating to it with what I was bringing, which was my theater experience. And the interesting thing, so anyway, to, to finish the story about the audition, I went in the booth and all I had was my actor's imagination. And you know, when, when acting they say, you are your instrument. This is my instrument. This is, what it, this is what I play. And what you draw on is your life experience. It's everything you are. It's your whole being. It's all of your emotional memory is what you bring to what you perform. How you inhabit, they call it inhabiting a character. How you inhabit the character is everything from your life. And all they can teach you in acting school is how to liberate yourself from your own inhibitions, how you can reach your true emotional depth so that you can access it for the character. That's what they teach you in acting school, how to sort of liberate yourself. So I went in and I just immersed myself in this character's experience. I thought, he watched his parents die when he was eight years old, brutally. He's had to survive on his own since then. He's had to adjust to life. What would that do to you? How would you accommodate life? And as I used my imagination, it just sent me into this, this very, very dark, broody kind of place. And I came up with this sound, and I started using this sound. And they hired me on the spot. <laughs> they said, you got it. But. But it was just because I was, it was a, think about it. They'd seen 500 people. They'd been looking for months. They'd gotten so desperate that Andrea Romano had started calling, casting people in New York. Who did they know? And it was a New York casting agent who said, oh, there's this young actor, Kevin Conroy. He's in LA right now. Why don't you see him? He does a lot of classics. He might be just what you need because Batman is a classic hero. Think about it. It was my background. And I was, this was Batman who's, he doesn't, he can't fly, he can't th see through walls, he, he can't run, you know, a million miles an hour, he's not the Flash. He's a, he's a mortal, he's, he's a mortal, he's a human being with no superpowers, but his will, his, his will to conquer evil, to not let life crush him. It's why we love him so much. He's just like us, but he doesn't let life crush him. He conquers life. He creates ways to fight evil. He uses his mind and he uses his passion. And it's why we love him so much. But that's like all those classic heroes. It's, 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 a, it's Achilles, it's Orestes, it's Hal, Prince Hal. It's all those roles that I had been doing on stage. So it was kind of a weird, weird coincidence that that was the one role that I auditioned for.
the first animated role I auditioned for. And it's lasted 27 years. I mean, it's weird. It's weird. It's just, it's just, a, it's a very unusual story, let me tell you. And it's a very, I don't know, it was like fate. It was just fate that brought me into that room at that moment. And the fact that he had, the issues the man has, the kind of issues he has. I always call him a rich boy with issues. He's, there, there's a, my favorite movie is Mask of the Phantasm. The great movie. And, and like I was saying, we are our instrument. An actor is what he play, he, it's what he, it's the tool he plays to bring a character to life. Bruce Wayne's issues are about his parents and their death. His unresolved relationship with his father. It haunts him. And in Mask of the Phantasm, he suddenly discovers what love is. He falls in love with Andrea Beaumont. And he suddenly discovers, oh, this is what life's about. It's not about being an angel of vengeance. It's about love. It's about sharing love with someone. But in order to do that, he has to be released from the vow that he's made his parents. So he goes to his, there's a wonderful scene. He goes to his parents' grave. And he's asking his parents to release him from his vow. And as I was playing that scene, I was asking my father, please, please, please let me go. And as I was doing it, I was 16-year-old Kevin, and I was in the hospital room by my father, who had tried to kill himself, pleading with him, saying, why? Why have you done this? Because my father was a mess. And all of this came out. All of this emotion came out. And after we played the scene, Andrea stopped the recording. She came into the room. She grabbed me. She put her arms around me. She said, I don't know where you went. I don't know where you went. But it was perfect. We're not going to record anything else today. That was it. Because all the issues Bruce had with his parents, I kind of had with my father. The unresolved issues. Um, and so all of that comes out in your acting. Uh, so th that's one of the reasons I love that, that movie so much. It had personal resonance for me. But... Acting is an amazing thing. It's about... <sighs> it's hard to explain. If I was in your seat, I couldn't tell you these stories. I'd be too nervous. I'd be uncomfortable. But when I'm on this, in this pool of light right here, and especially if the house lights were off and it was dark. This is my safe space. This is where I feel comfortable. That's the difference between actors and non-actors. Actors get on a stage and they think we're um, exhibitionists or something. It's not. It's just that this is where we feel comfortable sharing. Um, and most actors I know who are really wonderful stage actors, are very um, nervous, um, shy people off stage because that's another world. Do you, does that make sense? It's just a different, it's just a different, the, the wiring is different. When I was 12 years old, it's a great story. I had been through Catholic schools as a child, very traditional Catholic schools. I'm a little older than I look. And I mean, nuns had habits. They had clickers. It was a very, very hard school, Irish Catholic school. And, you know, we all went in line everywhere. We all got passes for everything. No one ever said anything in the hallways. It was very, very strict. 
when I was 12, we moved to a town that didn't have Catholic schools. So I was suddenly put in a public school, a very liberal, wild public school, where the kids were telling the teachers, hey, go shove it. And I thought, what? I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Kids were telling each other to shove it. They were telling the teachers to shove it. And I reacted by saying, what's the matter with you? To the other students, you know, getting very angry at them. So I was the one sent to the principal because they thought there was something wrong with me. They said, what's the matter with this new kid? I couldn't relate to what was going on. So they were sending me towards kind of um, remedial type uh, classes and stuff uh, because they thought that I had problems until one English teacher asked me to audition for the school play. That's when I was 12. And I went home and I read Our Town. I'd never read a play before. I'd never seen a play. And I saw it and I read George Gibbs and I came in the next day and I said, I'm playing George Gibbs. And she said, oh, are you really? Well, you know, you have to audition. <laughs> you have to audition. I said, what's an audition? She said, well, you have to, you know, try out. So we tried out and afterwards she said, you were right, you are playing George Gibbs. <laughs> And when I got up on that, it's, it's a play, it takes place on ladders. It's about small town America. And I got up on this ladder in this pool of light and all of my nervousness, all of my inhibitions, all of my, um, it all melted away. And I just felt like I was in this incredibly safe space. And they started putting me in A-level classes and I just started flying. I ended up graduating high school a year early. I just, that's a story about an English teacher seeing something in a student that no one else saw, which is a great story about a teacher. But it was also about what the theater did for me in terms of liberating me, um, sort of saving me in a way. Uh, and then I got a scholarship to go to Juilliard and um, I've been doing it ever since. But um, acting has been, it's been a savior for me all along. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful relationship. So, what else? I forgot there was an audience. I was so, <laughs> <laughs> I was so into what you were saying here. Right? It, it, it couldn't have been said better. I think you explained it to a T. You really Thank did. Thank you. Thank you really so did. You, you want to go ahead and get to some, some yeah, questions Yeah, let's get some here? questions. Let's get some questions. Enough about me. What do you think of me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I speak for all of us when we say you're terrific. You are Batman for all of us. Thank you. Woo! Thank Woo! you. Thank you. You know this character probably better than all of us. Can Batman ever be happy can Bruce Wayne be truly happy and still be Batman? That's a really, really good question. And that's, that's exactly the moment he gets to in Mask of the Phantasm. That's exactly what I was talking about. He suddenly realizes what happiness is. He has this moment of happiness with Andrea Beaumont. But he feels like he has to be released from the vow. And that scene at the grave where he's begging his parents to let him go, you know what happens next? Whoosh! A flock of bats comes screaming out of the earth, and it's his fate grabbing him by his neck and pulling him back down into the bat cave. And he knows he can't escape his fate. I mean, I mean, that's a Greek tragedy. I mean, that's just classic theater, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing. That's amazing. So can Batman be, bat be happy and be Batman? No. I think once he found happiness, he wouldn't need to be Batman anymore. He would become something else. He would still be a force of good, but I don't think he'd be Batman. Personally. Does that make sense? Yeah, wow, thank you. And for a lifetime of work, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great question. I, um, I apologize, I'm, st I'm still crying a little bit from the story. Oh, no. <laughs> no, um, 
I'm sorry, this I was going to ask you um, if there were any episodes that were particularly um, emotional for you to do yeah. when you told the story about your father's bedside. I just I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean. <laughs> no, I didn't I'm mean sorry. To get you upset. <laughs> I didn't no, mean to get I, upset. I, I. Well, it's funny you mention that because there's always this line you want to, you, you don't want to cross as an actor. You you want to share. You want to share your most intimate thoughts, but you don't want to sh share to the point of being embarrassing, or or being uh, inappropriate. But in talking about Batman, I have such a personal relationship with him that I feel that I can go farther than I would normally, especially with you, the audience of Batman, because you guys are unbelievable. You're so supportive um, that I feel, I feel like a family. So, um, but the question was, um, sorry, um, which episodes? Well, Mask, I mean, um, Perchance to Dream is one of my favorite episodes. It's a great episode because of this, what I'm talking about. Because I played Bruce Wayne in Batman, which I always play. <laughs> and then, I, then he gets drugged by the Riddler. So I played drugged Batman. And when he's drugged, he goes back to his adolescence. So I played adolescent Bruce Wayne. And they had me do Thomas Wayne the father. So I was doing five characters who all had to be distinct, but related. You know what I mean? But distinct. So I said to Andrea, this is gonna be so cool. I said, can I play it in real time? Just do character to character to character to character. She said, you'll be acting with yourself. <laughs> I said, yeah, could you imagine anything better? <laughs> She said, well, I'll let you do that once, and then we're gonna go back, and you're gonna do each character separately, fully through. So we have a clean, distinct character. But I love that episode because it gets into that whole psychology of Bruce Wayne and, and the relationship with his parents and how complicated he is, and that's why the character's so much fun to play. That's why everyone wants to play Batman, not so much because it's Batman, but because of Bruce Wayne and why he becomes Batman. He's so complicated. That's why actors love playing the role. And, and also, that's why it's so much fun watching different actors play the role. Everyone says, oh, well, I like Ben Affleck's actor, or I like Drew, or George Clooney's actor, or I like you know, this actor, that actor. I can't make a choice, because what's so much fun is watching different actors do it. Like, to me, Mark Hamill is Joker. He just is my Joker. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. 100%. We all love Mark. We all love Mark. And he is, he is my joker. He is, we have a great relationship. We're like yin and yang for each other. We, we make each other so much better. He makes me better, and I think I make him better. So we love each other. But then I saw Heath Ledger. And he's not better, but he's just so different and great. I thought, wow, that's a whole different take on Joker. And then Jared Leto's Joker. I mean, there have been so many different, uh, Troy Baker, who does a voice of Joker. There are so many different takes on it that each actor gets different flavors out of it and different colors out of it. They're not my Mark Hamill, but they're all valid. You know, they're just different. So that's the way I feel about the live action uh, Batman too. I, I, to me, they're all fascinating. I'm a big Michael Keaton fan. I loved what he did. Yeah. I loved what he did. But then Ben Affleck nailed it, I, I thought. I thought he was great. So, so those debates about who's the best, I can't tell. But that's one of my favorite episodes, Pretends to Dream. No, Legends of the Dark Knight is another great one. But you know, how, where, do you, where do you pick? There's one that I love. <clears throat> Am I blue? Yes. Am I blue? Don't these tears in these eyes telling you there was a time I was 
was her only one, but now I'm all sad and lonely one, lonely. I like that episode. <laughs> I didn't know we were getting a concert. Woo! I like that episode, too. (laughs) So, uh, obviously, not only have you played Batman over 27 years... uh, Since I was 10, yeah. yeah, You've also played him across multiple... Played multiple versions of the character across many different mediums. Uh, But as an actor... Uh, do you start the process of developing the character over each time, or do you think of it all as one role? You know, the anim- Bruce Wayne of the animated series is Bruce Wayne of the Arkham games is Bruce Wayne of Crisis on Infinite Earths. People ask me, how has the character changed over 27 years? And my answer always is that he hasn't. Um, the trick for me has been to keep him consistent to keep him fresh, to keep him alive and real um, without it getting old. Um, It's always the same character. You just have to mine it more deeply. And for me, the trick of getting into the voice was never just sort of aping a deep husky voice. It was always, at the beginning of recording, thinking about that moment when he watched his parents get murdered in front of him, what that did to him, and where that sent him. And it just brings it, so it brings it out of your gut. Because I have this theory that we can hear a lie faster than we can see a lie. Someone can give you a pretty good poker face, but I think you can hear in their voice when they're lying to you. My grandmother, Irish, always said, Kevin, always listen to what they're telling you in the first five words they're telling you. Because they're normally telling you exactly who they are. And I've never forgotten that. Always tell, listen what people are saying when you first meet them, because it's before they know what you want, they, what you want them to say. And they're usually telling you exactly who they are. I think you can hear a lie faster than you can see a lie. That's just my own, my own feeling. And I think you guys, who are so tuned into Batman that you have personal relationship with him, would hear if I was lying, if I was phoning it in, if I was not really doing it, you'd hear it in a heartbeat. So if the trick to me for 27 years is, how do you keep it fresh? Now, the different mediums that you go through, like recording the shows, We do a a half an hour show in two hours. It's recorded in two hours. And we're the first stage. The actors get the scripts before any of the artwork is done. The record is the first stage. So when we get the scripts, and they always have us in a room together. So you're in there with Mark Hamill, Roddy McDowell, um, all these wonderful actors, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., um, Adrian Barbeau, I mean, just Gene Smart, wonderful actors. and you do a radio play. You're, you're working with them like, like you and I are sitting here, and you're working. So you, in acting, you give what you get, and you get what you give. If you give someone, you know, it's like playing ball. You get the ball going in the room. And if you have someone across from you who's really hot, you're going to give them a better performance back. It just gets going. And the bookings for uh, Batman were always great because they always had these wonderful actors in there. So we're the first stage. So doing the records for the shows was wonderful. Doing the records for the movies was wonderful. Then 20 years later, I get a call to do a, a game. Arkham. I know, I know. We all love Arkham. But the process of recording a game is totally different. They need complete separate takes of every character because of the way the game is fed into the computer, the algorithms. Depending on how you play the game, depending on what rabbit hole you go down in the game, it all has to be separate. And they have different records for every one of those different avenues. So each line has to be recorded separately. So I would go in alone, 
And for four hours, I'd be alone in a booth, and you're keeping the character alive, the voice alive, creating the situation in your mind that he's in, and they're saying, okay, now 100 people are running after you, and you're, and you, and you're, telling, um, uh, you're telling Robin to, to, uh, to, get, to get out of the Batcave because people are coming in, and you say, get out. They say, great, give us three takes. Get out, get out, get out. Perfect. Now do it again, and okay, now do it with a smile. <laughs> You're thinking, why would he be smiling with 100 people running into the Batcave? Okay. Get out. <laughs> get out. Okay, now keep the smile perfect and a little touch of irony. I'm not exaggerating. These are the kind of directions you get because they want every possible version they could get. And by the end of four hours, alone in a booth like this, you're dripping with sweat. You're not even speaking English anymore. You don't know who you're playing. And they say, okay, lunchtime. And you go for lunch and you come back and you do it for four more hours. And Arkham Knight, the third in the series, took two years to record. Guess how many, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's a great catch. But guess how many lines are in it? Guess how many lines had to be recorded? One million. Five. 37,000 lines. Isn't that unbelievable? Because, just because all those variations live in the computer depending on where you go. So it took forever, and you're alone. You don't have Mark Hamill feeding you. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole different experience. So it's much, 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 much harder to do. And it's not as much fun. But when you see the result, and you're flying through Arkham, you know, with Batman, it's so cool. You think, oh my god, that's me. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm flying through Arkham, you know. So you're so proud of it when it's done, but the process it's kind of like going to the dentist. It's no fun. <laughs> Hi. All right, hello. Uh, I just want to say that to me, you're the most iconic and true version of Batman. Thank you. And, uh, and my question to you is, uh, with so many superheroes, not just Batman, in terms of their representation and their voice, uh, so many of them have that tough, like, sound gritty voice with a bit of cold, cold heartedness. Uh, when you decided to voice Batman, what made you go with that more compassionate, warm voice, uh, voice or tone in your voice, such as in an episode like uh, Baby Doll or... or That's with, an uh, interesting question. What, what, was, what brought out, instead of being a tough, gritty, guttural sound, what made it a, a warm, guttural sound? <laughs> I, think that's, I think that just naturally happened because of the compassion of the man. That, that's, that's where you hear the heart of, of Bruce Wayne, the broken heart. That's, that's what it is. That's where you hear his broken heart. Uh, that's the difference between, you know, uh, a bullock, hey, you, get out of here, and, uh, and a Bruce Wayne. There's just, there's more love in it. Oh, baby. <laughs> I really didn't know that's where that was going. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that's it, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Next question. So my question for you, you say we're all like a family or anything. Has there been like one fan that's impacted your life? Oh, yeah. And interestingly, um, almost every month, there's another. It's amazing. There was one young woman, and I, I apologize to her. I've told this story so frequently. Um, at Chicago Comic Con, and she came up to me, and I could see she was very emotional. She was sort of 30-ish. And she said, I've always wanted to hold you, can I give you a hug? He said, of course. 
It's kind of like meeting Santa Claus, of course. <laughs> and as she's holding me, she started to cry. And I realized, oh, this is, this is profound. There's something profound going. She said, no, you don't understand. She said, I grew up in the projects on the south side of Chicago. Every kid I grew up with is either dead or in jail. She said, and I got out, and I have a life, and I'm a professional, and you are largely why. She said, every afternoon, my mother was working two shifts. My father was working two shifts. I had no one, but I had Batman. They were too busy working to support our family, and I was alone, and I had Batman. And you taught me good from bad, right from wrong. What was, she said, you were my safe place every afternoon. And I thought, God, for an actor to know that your performance touches someone and touches a life that profoundly is amazing. It's just a blessing. Um, so yes, I've, every, and then just quite frankly today, someone said, uh, this morning, a very similar story. I won't say it now because I don't want to embarrass the person, but a very similar story of um, having had a very, very, very rough childhood. We forget, we all get wrapped up in our own dramas, that some people have really horrible childhoods, are challenged, and any life preserver is is cherished, and these shows, to many kids, are life preservers. Um, and boy, to be a part of that, God, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's like a mission, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. So that's an interesting question, it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so you've been like doing this character for like 27 years. You've been doing it like on animation, video games, and like now a television, which is crazy. So what is your favorite project you worked on or you're excite excited about? Uh, you know, if you ever ask an actor what his favorite job was, he will tell you the last job he just did. <laughs> I'm real, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's usually that because it's the one that was the most fun that he just had. And this Crisis on Infinite Earth, the actors I worked with, um, uh, Ruby Rose, who plays Batwoman. Yeah. I'm telling you, she's a young actress. Uh, I really, I wasn't familiar with her work. And we worked together and her eyes, when you work with her, she just gives and gives and gives. And not all, not, not all you know, actors are people. There are generous ones and selfish ones, kind ones and mean ones, ones you want to work with and ones you just want to run away from. You know what I mean? <laughs> there are great actors and there are shitty actors. Pardon my <laughs> She had eyes that were like pools that you just wanted to dive into. She was so generous. And we just had some wonderful moments together. And I had a great time. Um, but I think when you ask most actors what their favorite performance is, they're gonna, if they're stage actors, they're gonna tell you stage, a stage performance. I did a play on Broadway called Eastern Standard that I was incredibly proud of. I was very, very proud of, it was a big hit. Um, uh, but I, I've just been so happy with so much stuff that I've done. I'd love to do more on camera, I think it would be fun. This was fun, this was fun for me. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So, more questions about Crisis on Infinite Earth. Um, You're trying to get me to give something away. Well, I, no, and I'm not giving I, anything away. My question is, like, what was kind of your, your favorite interaction you had with filming all of that? Whether what was my favorite interaction in all that? Correct, yes. Um, I guess it was when the producer called and offered me the job. <laughs> 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 no, look, ten, 10 years ago, I was at a Comic-Con like this, and someone yelled out, 
<laughs> Actually, there are a lot of great stories about that. But someone once yelled out, are you in the next Arkham game? And I had been recording an Arkham game. But I didn't think anyone knew about it yet. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, the one that's been announced. It was just announced today. There's an Arkham game coming out. Are you in that game? And I went, oh. <laughs> Has that been announced? And someone else in the audience said, yeah, 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 that was announced. I said, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in that game. And they said, whoa, that's so cool. And they started talking. I said, well, wait a minute, that's not the game I'm doing. And then someone said, what Arkham game are you doing? <laughs> By the time I got backstage, the phone, my cell phone was ringing. I was hearing from Warner Brothers people, you are so screwed. <laughs> I didn't know there was another Arkham game that had been being recorded that was being released while I was doing my Arkham game. They didn't tell us. I said, well, if you want us to keep a secret, you have to tell us what else is going on. I said, they asked about a game. I said, yes, I'm in that game. I didn't know there was another game. I got so screwed. <laughs> so I'm very careful now when people ask leading questions yeah. like that. <laughs> I don't say anything. So um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what it made me think of was a funny time. Another question. It's always dangerous when you get these questions from the audience. This is like 10 years ago. Someone yells out from the back of the house, how old are you anyway? I thought, well, that's a very rude question. So I thought, he doesn't deserve an honest answer. So I'll just lie a little bit. I said, well, I'm 50. And he went, whoa, dude, rough life, huh? <laughs> And then the whole audience roared with laughter because there are no secrets anymore. Everyone knows how old you are because of the internet. I said, well, you didn't expect me to tell you the truth, did you? But that's become famous with my friends. They go, whoa, dude. <laughs> Rough life, huh? <laughs> so but, you, you guys can be rough. The crowds can be rough. But you can't say anything. It's all a surprise right now, right? What? You can't say anything about the upcoming live action. No, no. It's all a surprise right now, so you'll be able to say some stuff soon. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say it's nice to meet you, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, my question is, of all the plays you've been in, which one is your favorite? The plays? Yes. The one this one I mentioned before, Eastern Standard, was a wonderful play. I had a, I had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, I was really proud of it, and um, I have had great th th plays, experiences. I, I did Midsummer Night's Dream in Central Park for Joe, Joe Papp, um, um, and uh, William Hurt was in it, and um, it was a great cast, uh, Christine Baranski, and um, uh, I played Lysander, one of the lovers. I had a great time. Um, I played Laertes at the public for Joseph Papp in a production of Hamlet. Uh, I was very proud of that. Um, I did a the whole entire cycle of the Greek plays, the whole Aristia, at the, at the Hartford Stage Company where I played Orestes and Achilles. Um, I, I've, you know, I've been lucky. I've, I've played some really wonderful roles that I've been really proud of. I've also done some real clinkers. I did a Broadway production of Lolita the Nabokov play, starring Donald Sutherland. It was a very, very, you know, written by Edward Albee. I mean, interpreted by Edward Albee. But it was a disaster. It was a 20-pound, self-basting turkey. It was a disaster. <laughs> they ran us in Boston for like a month, and we said, are we ever going into New York? And they said, we're not really sure. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> And um, so I've done things that I'm embarrassed about, too. But, uh, no, I've, I've been lucky. I've done a lot of stuff I'm proud of. Thank you so much. Sure. Hey there. Hello. <laughs> uh, once again, uh, 
thank you again for coming to Minnesota. It's really great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so my question is going to be a little more interesting here. Uh, so for the longest time, we've all imagined you as Batman, and we've always enjoyed, you know, hearing your voice and, you know, seeing Batman do awesome stuff with your voice. The, my question is, though, if there was any other role that you would consider your dream role, what would it be? Mm, dream role. All right. Ooh, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to do with that one, bat brain? <laughs> oh my God. That would be fun. It'd be fun to play that. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank sure. You. You've practiced that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Conroy. Hello. Um, I just want to say, as a fellow actor, um, I love your stance on uh, your ideals of what it means to be. I follow those ideals myself. Thank you. Um, and my question is, well, it starts with a little backstory that you've worked with many other Batmans in like voice acting. You've worked with the Brave and the Bold Batman. You worked with, um, you know, shoot, live action, 66, Adam West. Yeah. You worked with Adam West on one episode in the animated series. I'm the wondering- Grey Ghost, yeah. Is there any other Batman you'd want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Oh, sure, I'd love to work with all of them. Are you kidding? Mm. <laughs> I love working with actors. Um, yeah, I want to work with all, all, uh, all actors. Thank you. Um, that goes without saying. Mark, Mark is a wonderful example of this. He's a truly generous person. Like I was saying before, there are all kinds of people who are actors. There are nice ones, there are not nice ones. Mark is a, is a gem. And one reason it's so much fun to work with him is because he loves actors. He has a big heart. And I, I love telling people this story. I was in a recording session with him once, and to watch Mark watch another actor work is an act of generosity. It's wonderful. And you know how people can be a little selfish or a little competitive? People are competitive. It's human nature. Mark, looking at another actor give a good performance, this is what I saw. I looked across the room, and this is what I saw. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I saw a 12-year-old kid looking at a candy, candy store, and I burst out laughing. I went, ha! And Andrea said, cut! <laughs> Kevin, you ruined the take. What's so funny? I said, look at him! <laughs> How can you not laugh? <laughs> So, so that's much. what, that's what, uh, next question. So I've had to rethink this question like three times while waiting in line because you keep answering it for me. Uh oh. So the question I have for you now is learning that you knew little to nothing about Batman going in. Yeah. As the years went on, did you find that you started to get some leeway? Like, if you got some lines and you felt like, oh, this isn't Bruce Wayne or this isn't Batman, did you find to start that you were able to start getting some leeway in saying, I don't think this is what he would do <laughs> I'm laughing because people ask me that a lot. They say, do you ever get a chance to, like, Okay. Ad lib or add to the script or something, and I say always say you've obviously never worked with Hollywood writers before. <laughs> if you think actors have egos, believe me, we're pussy cats <laughs> compared to producers and writers. Right. They want the period where the period goes. They want the comma where the comma. Hey, look, I didn't put a comma there. I mean, it's incredible. They want what they wrote, and the reason you're cast is because. They feel you're the most equipped to bring what they've written to life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you come in and start screwing around with it, that's not what they're looking for. Um, so to answer your question, not, not really. I think maybe once or twice Bruce Tim might have said, Kevin, what would Batman say? What would Bruce say now? And I'm saying, and I always answer, are you kidding me? <laughs> if I suggest anything, you'll shoot me down. Um, they have... They have very healthy egos. All right, thank you. Sure. 
We have about three minutes left. Okay. Hi. Hey, Kevin. We, this is Ashton. We met earlier today. Yeah, we, um, met, we met downstairs. Yep. Um, so I'm, I want to ask a question with a question first. Uh -huh. Get your preference. Would you like my question or my request? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> what is your request? Um, if you remember the ending of Arkham Knight where Batman's dueling with Joker inside of his mind or being held hostage by Scarecrow, um, could you do the line where you're explaining to Joker what he's afraid of and at the end of it you exclaim, you're Batman? Oh, I'm sorry, I really don't remember the lines. I do have a prompt, if that helps. <laughs> You have you have it on you? Yeah. Is that a Can I have it? Sure. He's prepared. Of being active? Ashes. Ashes. You're afraid of being ashes. You're afraid of being forgotten, Joker. Because of me. And what was your question? Um, out of your many role lines of Batman, what is one of your lines that um, you remember the most that impacted you the re most? It's not who I am underneath. It's what I do that defines me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a round of applause to Kevin Conroy. Thank you.